Zucchini. The zucchini. I can't say it. Why did I pick the one vegetable? I struggled to say. I should say broccoli like a normal f***ing person. Hi, I'm Henry and welcome to Pink Bikes Summer Field Test. This is the brand new GT Force. It's a bike that rides the wave of progressive design. Enduro, check. Long travel, check. 29 inch wheels with an idler pulley and a seat tube angle steeper than grocery prices in Squamish. Absolutely check. I mean, it's like $10 for a zucchini. It's absolutely daylight robbery, but that's a personal issue which I won't bring into work. Now, how does that tech sheet translate to on-trail performance? Well, we're here to find out. To look at the new GT Force, your eyes are immediately drawn towards the center of the bike and that idler. Now, this bike uses GT's ruckus management system. Now, what this basically means is that idler's got a chain guide and there is frame protection aplenty to keep the noise down. It comes with the same rear triangle, irrespective of size. However, any issues in sizing should be negated by the ability to adjust the chainstay length by 10 mil. There's a 435 or a 445 option that should cater for most eventualities. I'm six foot tall or 183 centimeters thanks to Uncle Napoleon and I'm riding the 480 mil reach size large. So now it's time for what you're all here for, the rear suspension on this force. So as you can see, not only does it use an idle pulley, but also a medium height rear pivot. Now, what that means is that rearward axle path should help with square hits as well as all round bump absorption. This new iteration of the GT Force not only has that higher pivot, but it's combined with a longer rear center. Now, GT claim this is able to provide more grip and stability than the previous version of the bike. This particular model, the GT Force Pro LE, uses a RockShox Zeb Ultimate fork and a Super Deluxe Ultimate on the back. The front delivers 170 mil of travel and the rear delivers 160 mil of travel derived via a 230 I2I standard eyelet shock with a 65 mil stroke. So we've got this enduro box checking machine, but GT aren't the only one to bring a high pivot bike to the party. So how does this bike compare not only to bikes such as the Transition, the Capra and the WeR1, but also to the Norco, which shares some of the same design characteristics. All right, it's time to talk about how the GT climbs. This is a big bike, it's heavy, it's got a lot of travel, it has a high pivot with an idler pulley. Does that mean that it's a terrible climber? I wouldn't say so. I mean, it requires the lockout. It does have you reach for the lockout. But as we've talked about before, these, this style of bike will tend to be crawl up a fire road, unlock and yep. down you go. Yep. I think it, um, it definitely benefits, at least for me, from that steep seat tube angle. Mm -hmm. I've got a really comfortable position on it. And um, yeah, I mean, it definitely isn't a bad climb. It's got quite a lot of grip as well. Okay, all right. What about you, Matt? When you're climbing this thing, are you reaching for that pedal assist switch? Yeah, it depends on the trail. If it's a more technical climb, I usually prefer to have the shock open so mm -hmm. you get lots of traction, which this bike has. But for fire roads, yeah, there was a little bit more bob. Like Henry said, the seat tube angle was nice and steep. So yeah, why not flick the lever, get up there. Mm -hmm. I think even with the lever switch, at least for me, and obviously, you know, it's like different weights, etc. For me, it's still where it was with the climb switch would actually be a really nice compromise of, of uh, it still bobs just a little bit. Even with the climb switch? Even with the climb switch. So it might need a firmer pedaling tune is what no, you're saying. No, I wouldn't say so. I think it actually puts it right in the, in the crosshairs of good traction and good pedal efficiency. Okay. Similar to the transition, actually. It definitely wasn't fast on the efficiency test. It had the second slowest time. Uh, the only slower time was that big Norco range, also a high pivot bike with an idler. I, I would say it's quite comparable. I mean, I think, you know, we're here, it's beautiful sunshine. We're out riding on dry days. So for us here, yeah. I don't see it being a problem. If you lived in a peat bog, it might be a bit different. And I think, you know, for... I do you know somebody that lives in a peat bog? Have you ever been to Scotland? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't bother me. Like there are lots of things that compromise how well a bike climbs, like yep. grippy tires. But you do it because it enables you to basically reap the gains of the performance. And 
I think it's cool, I, you know, I think some people really like the idler pulley mm. and it doesn't affect with what light I see the bike in at all when it comes to climbing performance. I quite simply don't care. All right, and that brings us to descending. We've got that nasty climbing behind us. It's time for the fun stuff. Yeah. The GT high pivot bike with an idler pulley, 160 millimeters of travel. This is the be all and end all of suspension designs if I was to read the internet. Yeah. What do you think of the bike's rear end? I think, for me, it struck a really nice balance between small bump and tracking. Okay. You know, sometimes we talked about it before, you might find yourself closing in the external adjustment on the low speed compression. Mm -hmm. And what I found with the GT was right off the bat, it didn't require any of that external adjustment. Mm. With it fully open, it was absolutely dialed and tracked really well, particularly at high speed. Matt? Yeah, I would also agree with Henry. Um, I got pretty comfortable with this bike relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And once you got it up to speed, it just seemed to work really well over those repeated hits. And I think with the GT, one thing that, that it does do really well is it's got a meaningful geometry adjustment. Mm. It's not, you know, that 0.3 degrees on the YT, which is just, yeah. Useless. Why bother? Just, honestly. It's, you know what that is? It's a selling point. It's yeah. somebody on the sales floor to say, oh, it's adjustable too. Yeah, I mean, I feel a certain way about geometry flip chips. I think that if you're going to do it, do it properly. Like yeah. GT have. Offer 10 mil of rear center adjustment on the chain stay. 445 to shorten to 435? Yes, totally. Okay. Yeah. I mean, from GT's end, it's probably actually, it's probably a good double header because what it does is it probably lets them give you a cheaper bike by them yep. only, only making one rear end and it enables the user to have that adjustment themselves. Right. It sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, okay. You could, if you wanted to, run it 10 mil shorter yep. to get it more playful. I, playful is not a word I would call this bike. Yeah. This bike is fast. We've also seen it, you know, with on that um, GT team, they've been using it with downhill forks at points. Yeah. You know, it is a bike that loves going fast. It's yeah. a bike that on that rough stuff, on that chunder at yeah. high speed, yeah. it is fantastic. On the slower speed stuff, where you're just trying to basically just maintain speed through tight, twisty turns, yeah. for me, it didn't really butter the parsnips. Okay, butter the, butter the parsnips, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of going fast, what time did you put down on that GT? Was it a fast bike? Yeah, you know what? It was pretty comparable to the Norco. Yeah. It was a 2.46 as well. Okay, let's move on to handling now and just looking at this bike, it looks big. It's got a relatively long seat tube. We're gonna talk about that. It looks high off the ground. What does it translate to on the trail? What does that mean? So this bike's got 645 mil of stack, mm -hmm. which is pretty high. Now I think that combined with the rearward axle path, it does make it, for me, it becomes unwieldy at slower speeds, mm -hmm. especially on tight, tight stuff. So high front ends are really good, especially when you wanna go through something steep fast. Yeah. Rearward axle paths are really good when you want to go through something steep, fast. Yep. I think the combination of all of those, it just began to feel a bit too much. Okay. I, you know, I was running my handlebars on the on the steer at a fair bit lower, yep. and the bike did begin to come alive a bit then. However, this is something the wider, the faster the track, I can't emphasize this enough, yeah. the better the bike is. <laughs> And that brings us to component highs and lows of the build. Matt, we're gonna start with the good stuff and I'm gonna to toss it to you. What did you like about the build? I really liked the RockShox Zeb. It had really good small bump compliance. Yeah, the controls just worked. I could fine tune it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Effective adjustments, not too many, but totally, they work. Totally. And of course the thing is stiff as hell. Yeah, and then it's got like, you know, the bread and butter GX drivetrain on there. It's got the wide range. It just works for what it is. Yeah, it suits the bike, doesn't it? Totally. Yeah, Yeah. again, it's gonna sound like a broken record, but the bars were kooky. Yeah. Kookybars.com, I don't know what they were thinking. You know, I didn't really get behind you when you were talking about the We Are One bars being kooky, I love those, but I will say the cockpit on the GTE looks like it's something on like a $300 bike from Costco. Do you know what the bars look like? You know when people pr like paint seagulls in like 300 meters in the distance and they just do like a weird V? Yeah. That's what they are. They're, yeah. The bend starts in a really weird place. It puts you into a really uncomfortable position. And it's not that you couldn't get used to it. Again, that's because we might come with time. Yeah. But hopping between these bikes, every time I got on, I just thought, not you, not again. These bars, what's up with them? One thing yeah. I did like though, and I think something that the product manager, if you're listening, you absolutely got bang on, that was the 220 mil rotor on the front. For a bike that goes this fast, I see no reason why they shouldn't all have 220 mil rotors okay. everywhere. All right.
All right, that brings us to models and pricing. And we've got some pretty fancy exotic bikes here. The GT though, it's a pretty everyday price structure that makes a lot of sense. So our Force Pro LE, that's a $6,000 bike, X01, Zeb Ultimate, Code RSCs. The one that's real interesting to me though, 5,000 bucks, Zeb Select Plus, GX Eagle, and Code R's, all on the same frame. So what do you guys think of that? I mean, I think $6,000 is still a large amount of money, but it can get you something really good. It's similar with the Transition and the YT. Yeah. It's not good, I think, like, I know I keep going on. There were lovely bikes had in this test, but $6,000 is a lot of money. It should get you a pretty solid spec. Yeah. The $5,000 option is good. I think going down to the $3,800 Elite, you know, the gaps start to appear. Yeah, so with that one, they're all based around the same frame. Yeah. But that one you're getting a Yari and that doesn't have a charger damper. Yeah. I think that's a motion control damper in that one and an SX drivetrain. And there are definitely some noticeable differences on the trail, especially in that damper and the drivetrain as well too, where Matt, I think you could ride the $5,000 GT blindfolded safely and you wouldn't know the difference between that and the $6,000 GT, but the $3,800 one, there's a big difference there. There's a big difference. I mean, I think that the code RSCs, I'm not saying it's worth a thousand dollars, but they are an upgrade worth having. I think the, the power they able, you know, you can change the bike point. That is really useful. But I mean, for me, I actually think the $6,000 is a really good rounded package. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I would agree. These are, you know, really great bikes, uh, but they're a little more affordable for the everyday person. Mm -hmm. um, it just has a carbon front triangle and an aluminum rear. So it's not going to be out of this world pricing. All right, we're at the pros and cons. Matt, tell us the good stuff first. You know what? We have a lot of expensive bikes on test here. And for six grand, this is a really good enduro bike. You know, it pedals well. It's really good on the fast stuff. You've got an adjustable chain stay and just kind of has those key features, uh, the strong brakes and the good suspension. Yeah, that all makes sense. Henry? You're a British guy, let's hear some moaning. Oh, we do, we do misery. We're you the best do. In the world. All right. Fantastic, let me add it. So, as I believe I may or may not have mentioned. A couple times. On the slow speed stuff, it can get a bit unwieldy. It doesn't feel like it handles as well mm -hmm. on the slower speeds as some other bikes on test. Also, the seat tube just feels unnecessarily long. It's, I don't understand why. It doesn't need to be that long, so. I know, just make just, it shorter. Just, just, would you just take a saw to it? Yeah, sure, yeah, get the Dremel out, make a night of it. Yeah. You know, give yourself some lacerations from the carbon dust and yeah, away yeah. you go. No, uh, aesthetically as well, it's probably a better crowd divider. It looks I mean, that's bit, pretty subjective. It is a bit subjective, but there is a certain school of bike design that is inspired by Alien vs Predator, yeah. and I'm vehemently against it. Oh, really? Yeah, I just think, honestly, like, if a bike looks like it was a, a bike, Ridley Scott bike. A Ridley Scott designing bike. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is he the guy behind Scott? Yeah. <laughs> no, jokes aside, aesthetically, it's very subjective. Yeah. I think it could look a little bit a little bit better. The last thing I would maybe complain about is for people that want to run their rear brake on the left, you're not gonna get the neatest routing because it's got full internal uh, routing that you can't basically. Why don't you just run your brakes you. the right way around and then you don't have to deal with that? I mean, I agree. Yeah. I tried. And? I nearly died. Oh, okay. I mean, I did try, genuinely. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. But it doesn't really work. Yeah, okay. All right, and that brings us to the type of rider that the GT Force best suits, and of course, the type of terrain. So Matt, who is this bike for? You know, uh, given the budget-friendly pricing, I would say this would be really good for somebody who's gonna get into enduro racing. Mm -hmm. It's got the geometry, it's got the suspension, it's sort of an easy way in. Yeah, and the terrain, Henry? I, you know, I would say this is, you know those people that ride only in the park, but unaccountably have enduro bikes? Mm. Perfect. All right. Absolute singlet, full face helmet. Yeah. And basically just, you, for some reason, have an enduro bike. Great yeah. stuff. All right, there you go. That is it for the GT Force. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these videos because there are a whole bunch more coming, including the impossible climb and the efficiency test and the huck to flat. And we'll see you there.